Hello everyone, welcome, huge movie fanatic Nate, stopping on by for yet another one of these fan commentaries. Today I will be regaling you with my audio commentary for the film from the early 80s by the name of Just Before Dawn. I've got the 88 films, I think it's like Slasher Collection Blu-ray release. I'll be watching the, um, there's two cuts on this since the normal, you know, whatever it's called, U.S. version or theatrical cut. I think it's called the U.S. version or whatever. Since that one's more prevalent out there in the world, I'll, I'll be watching the normal, whatever it's called, U.S. version, theatrical cut, U.S., you know, shorter version on this Blu-ray. <clears throat> so let's get to it. I'll, as always, um, for obvious copyright reasons, my audio commentaries feature none of the actual sound or audio of the movie itself, just a lovely blank screen and the audio of me talking about the film. I don't know the, the dialogue very well in this movie because I don't know this movie very well, so, um, you know, you guys are welcome to watch the movie along with my commentary on your, uh, on your end, and throughout the movie I'll try to do dialogue or sound effects to keep you you know, to get you guys and or keep you in sync if you choose to watch the movie along with me. There might be those of you out there who know the movie well enough to just listen to the commentary and know what's happening based on what I'm talking about. But with no further ado, let's uh, start the film here, just before dawn. Fades in, beautiful Doro Vatlato Heldrudevic presents... A Jeff Lieberman film, beautiful uh, sunrise or sunset. I think it's supposed to be a sunrise. We don't know if it's a sunrise or sunset for the purposes of the actual production. Just before dawn, title appears, disappears, starring Chris Lemon, which is Jack Lemon's son, Greg Henry, Deborah Benson, Ralph Seymour. Mike Kellen, beautiful sunset or sunrise there, and George Kennedy as Roy. He's basically the Donald Pleasance of this film, the little bit of star power they could get. Co-starring those people, director of photography, Joel and Dean King. I don't know if they're brothers. It might stand a reason. Editor there. Beautiful imagery, though. Executive producers by the name of those people. Don Stillman's the executive in charge of production. Music by Brad Fidel, who'd go on to do Terminator 1 and 2, and True Lies, and other movies, I would imagine. But incidentally, um, you know, I got uh, on, on eBay years ago this. Uh, 88 Films Blu-ray release. I want to say I'm pretty sure it's region free. That would explain the reason why I in North America am currently watching it with a non-region free normal North American Blu-ray player. Opening credits are now over. Now we basically introduce a couple of characters that are going to start off the film. Basically victims. Hunters, obviously, as we see a, see a dead deer on the hood of this red truck from the 60s. This, this guy, I don't know his name, unfortunately, but the, we're looking at this guy who's just tilting up the uh, little podium there, and this other guy's walking in. He's going to start trying to peel off a little bit of wall drapery to bring home to his girlfriend or wife or whatever. This guy, um, if, if there's any Sleepaway Camp fans, this, this boozer here who's uh, boozing at the podium and looking up into the hole in the roof would also be in Sleepaway Camp. I think this is before, like a year before Sleepaway Camp. The Holy Spirit! <laughs> ha Boing! There's a goofy, uh, kind of a dimly lit shot of some creepy looking guy in the roof hole. The other guy's trying to peel off the stuff on the wall to bring home to the missus. 
I'm not, I was trying to think right before I started this uh, commentary, I was trying to think of when I first saw this movie. I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I might have gotten the VHS in like, you know, the early 2000s. I may not, I think I probably would have gotten the VHS, I would imagine, previously viewed for video update when they were purging their VHS tapes. They, you know, in the early 2000s, they, you could get like uh, 20 tapes for ten dollars and you can bet that I cleared out a lot of their horror VHS back in the day. Um, the earliest I would have seen this was probably be the early 2000s if and when I, I did that. I've got so many movies and so many years of movie fandom and collecting that I can't remember if I've got the VHS. I think I may have the VHS for this but at any rate uh, later on I think in like 2005, 6, 7 ish the Shriek show Media Blasters would end up putting out a kind of a special edition DVD release of this, which featured um, just the standard North American theatrical cut. I want to say it actually it had two two DVDs, I think, and I think it kind of had like a second disc with special features. Here we got uh, the truck rolling, almost running this character over. Kind of a scary scene where the truck's gonna uh, deer falls off, boom, runs into a twee. Tr twee and explodes. This this guy's name here is guys. He's gonna die. I think he's got the one of the weirdest names in I've ever seen in a horror movie or any movie for that matter. Vachel. I want to say that this character's name here is about to die with the hat and the vest on. Is Vachel. And now he sees the killer, which we don't see. We see the and I, on the, on the, on the audio track here, you can hear the laughing. I think kind of the the goofy laughing. It reminds me of that animated cartoon character of Hanna Barbera. <laughs> Machete, uh, 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 it's, I think it kind of gets the machete in the groin and it kind of comes out as butthole as we can see if you're watching along. It's really kind of a cool opening movie kill there. Vachel, uh, that's what happens if you go to take stuff out of this dilapidated church I guess and we see the the killer here grab his little red beanie or orange or whatever the hell it is and that's a a theme throughout the course of this movie where the killer will kind of don the he's get putting on the vest there as well as he can over his bigger frame there kind of don some of the accoutrements of uh, the victims got the vest in the orange vest in the orange stocking camp there and we've got mr. guy from sleepaway camp getting scared and running away incidentally the, the you know this movie is, it, it really it begs to be seen on Blu-ray. I would highly recommend this uh, 88 Films Blu-ray. I'm pretty sure it's on, it's out on, you know, North American distri distributors as well. But movies like this that take play, place in the great outdoors and stuff really beg to be seen in the, the highest resolution possible. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, just standard Blu-ray is the best way to see this movie currently. We're introduced to our, uh, our young characters here kind of final girl and mr guy with the freaking he's always got his arm showing <laughs> kind of the fifth fifth wheel with the camera there franklin character oh yeah here you go kind of driving by these these twin girls who look like they're on skid row kind of doesn't really go with the rest of the scenery i would say but that that guy right there and then like the the short sleeve rugby kind of a shirt is is jack lemon's son he looks just like him looks like just like jack lemon i can't remember what his name is is it don lemon beautiful shot of kind of the mountain there this guy i wouldn't recommend driving like this i don't know if, if anyone's watching or even if you're not watching he's kind of driving with his forearms on the steering wheel now that nowadays this you know this movie it kind of predates airbags and obviously you don't want to be too close to the airbag in case the thing happens to for whatever reason jettison but introducing you know being introduced to the five young campers in this film and as i was saying you've got two couples traditional couples male and female Gee, they just hit a deer right there right here is like some kind of deer cry, cry happens there Oh, I, I don't want to forget to mention that that we just heard. I think it's over now. 
But it, this is something that is rarely done back in, in slasher films in the early 80s. And I want to say it, I, I, I regard it as a kind of a stupid business decision, which was, you know, the producer, whoever the hell, you know, financed this film thought it was worth the money to actually, you know, for such a low budget, you know, slasher film from the early 80s, they actually, um, they actually, like, bought the rights to use that Blondie song. I, I don't know the name of the, the song. But it's a very popular Blondie song that's featured at the beginning of this movie. It's it's come and gone, in the soundtrack. But it, it, you know it, it's it's one of the only times in you know I've seen a lot of slashers, early '80s slashers and stuff. And it's the only th- movie I think I can really remember of this genre and budget, where it's actually you know got a, a relatively famous song in it. So I I would regard that as you know I don't know I I can't imagine what that would have cost to you know to to buy the rights to, to use that popular Blondie song for this movie, but I, I it probably wasn't worth worth whatever they paid. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, so there you go. That's my personal opinion. Now, uh, was it Jack Don, Jack Lemon's son gives him this, this whistle. I think he says like, we're on an outing here. We're, we're on a goddamn outing. One of the shots is whistles in his mouth, the next shot it's not. So I know some of the dialogue. That, that, that character with the arm showing constantly in the, the baseball cap will go on to say one of the lines I always laugh at when I watch this movie, like, You don't know that. You don't know that. You don't know that. <laughs> Something along those lines. Now, now we're being introduced to a scared horse, we're, which is... Uh, he looks like he got loose there in the little horse area. Now we're showing, we're introducing the back of George Kennedy's head. And it's funny, if you listen to the soundtrack in this scene right here, as they're dollying around George Kennedy from the back, you can basically hear, like, the sound of the dolly, you know, like, rolling and on the floorboards and kind of making noise. You know, it's it, the, the noise that you hear is the sound of people walking the dolly from you know, position A to position B as George, or, uh, uh, what George Kennedy is delivering his lines regarding his Agatha, I want to say, his little pet tree there. And the horse, in the meantime, is <clears throat> going crazy. George Kennedy in this movie portrays this kind of like, uh, whatever the hell he is. What is he? Ranger? Forest Ranger? I don't, I don't actually know why in the, in the context of the movie the horse is going goofy. Maybe it's because of the up, upcoming... Yuck. He just kissed the horse. Upcoming motorhome RV thing here is... He, the, uh, George Kennedy's waving it down. Going to give one of his famous trailer lines. I'll try to... Uh, try to say it in sync with the character. I don't know this movie nearly as well as, say, you know, Friday the 13th films or The Forest and stuff, so I don't know if I'll be able to do it. But this is the the moment where George Kennedy, Forest Ranger characters, is telling these characters, like, I don't know, I, I wouldn't recommend going in there. This This one guy is... I can't remember which one it is. I think it's the guy with the you know, who doesn't believe in sleeves and the baseball cap on. I think he's got a deed. This deed don't mean nothing. He's got a deed to this mountain. That mountain can't read. So he's basically going to check out this land that they quote unquote own. It's it's fun. okay. Here comes the line. I think. At least tell me where you're going, so when you don't come back, I'll know how to fill out the report. I got that pretty well in sync. Silver Lake just kind of throws a a, a bogus location out. So this is, um, I ain't just whips, whistling Dixie you here. <laughs> I don't think that's what he's saying, but... Yeah, he, you know, this character, was it George Kennedy, I want to say? The actor is warning the kids not to go up there or whatever. I don't, I don't even really know why. Like, I don't think George, the George Kennedy character is necessarily, um, 
privy to the the inhabitants necessarily so i don't know why he's so you know he doesn't want these kids going up there or whatever but this is quite the uh quite the motor home as we've got the the fifth wheel here photographer kind of franklin character not not as annoying as franklin but the fifth wheel guy the girlfriendless guy photographer taking pictures I can't remember where this was filmed, but regardless, it's definitely a very photogenic wilderness, you know, situation here. Okay. Uh, I can't remember why they're stopping. Photographer guy ran out. He might have saw that guy from Sleepaway Camp. Oh, yeah, okay. This is the scene where the guy from Sleepaway Camp is gonna run upon them it is kind of interesting how normally in a slasher movie both of those characters would have died at the beginning but this sleepaway camp character i think he lives he never it never does end up dying which is kind of interesting short shorts on the redhead there and this more plainly dressed blonde chick who will undergo a character, you know, both kind of uh, visual and character transformation, you know, from be compared to the beginning of the film. At the end, she'll be like, she'll have made a 180. Yeah, I guess the photographer guy, as he's creeping up to the tree here, saw something from the bus as they were driving, looking for it, some guy. Looking for the guy this guy saw and not, you know, not being able to hear the dialogue. I don't know what the hell he's saying. Not nearly as familiar with this movie as some of the stuff I grew up with as since I didn't grow up with this movie. But, oh, what I was starting to say before is, um, you know, when I got the, uh, can't remember if I got the VHS for this or not, but regardless, I for sure saw it. If I didn't get the VHS in the early 2000s I for sure got the DVD and saw this for the first time at minimum like 05 06 or 07 with the Media Blasters Shriek Shriek Show special edition ah, ah, scares the chick coming out of the, the bush there this guy's great in general this, this actor I think all I've really seen him in is this in Sleepaway Camp I want to say, I don't know if I'm correct in this, but he might have been in one, uh, like an original Twilight Zone episode. I'm not 100% sure. But as I keep on trying to say, um, at, at, the, at the very minimum, I saw this movie for the first time around those, you know, 5, 06, 07 when I got the DVD. And, you know, I never was the biggest fan of Just Before Dawn. It, you know, I can remember when I when I originally saw it, like the music, like the Brad Fidel music, really didn't do a lot for me at the time. But it's it's definitely grown on me more as the years have have gone on, and you know, especially the the eighty eight films Blu Ray really is is a you know really showcases this film beautifully. But even with the eighty eight films Blu Ray, it's still not. A movie that I that I that I've seen very much, or watch very much. And not to say like it's not a bad film. It's just one of those for whatever reason, just never. Yeah, it's just uh, never did a whole hell of a lot for me. But I I like it, and it's definitely you know this time of year I'm recording this commentary in early June two zero two two and. Definitely this time of year, I generally kind of make a point to pull it out at least once. It's definitely, you know, I don't know if you're, if you're, if you're new to the channel or if this is some of the first stuff you're listening to of this channel, a lot of my, uh, more, you know, whatchamacallit, what are they called? Regular watchers and, and or listeners. Is that... License plate say, say 666? I couldn't tell. I know that I'm a big, huge fan of these kind of, you know, early 80s slasher films that take place in the woods. You know, The Forest, Don't Go in the Woods, Friday the 13th. This probably, you know, 
this film and there's probably other ones I can't think of right now just Sock and Slash in the Woods I absolutely love these movies and uh, Killer Guy jumps on the back of the camper and I think it's funny how the, the kids kind of bounce like like the guy jumping on is going to make that big of a difference but I was blabbing while the, the kids kind of left behind this, this drunk guy, boozer guy who wants help from the kids it, it's funny that he, he wanted you know a ride with them when they're actually going into where he wants to get away from but I, I thought it was funny when the, when the killer guy jumps onto the the camper like the kids just bounce around and stuff I think that's kind of funny in case anyone's watching or, or listening or whatever and wants to know what which of the two girls I find most attractive definitely the blonde not the biggest redhead fan in the world so the blonde is definitely more attractive of the two women in my opinion I mean the blonde here in the in the camper because if you know the film you'll know that another blonde female will appear look at this now look at that well I don't know if you can see it but what I was pointing out was the the front tires of this camper this must be like a six by six it looks like the the front tires were you know as the guys kind of going up this dirt grade looked like the front tires were actually um, powered so it's very possible that this freaking like six wheel camper is like a six by six I don't know if, if if I'm correct with that I'm not the biggest Winnebago or I don't know if this is technically a Winnebago but like a, a drivable camper guy I don't know I don't know much about my history with that but it did look like in that one shot that the, the front wheel was was powered so at this point in the movie that that's one of the things that I find really goof, goofy about this movie is they drive this huge freaking behemoth camper up into the woods and then they oh we got the killer there peering down from the top of the camper through the window they drive this huge behemoth camper up into the woods and then they they like go as far as they can in it and leave it behind and go out into the woods oh beautiful shot of waterfall beautiful shot of waterfall they go they leave the camper behind and go into the woods to camp in in tents which i think is kind of kind of ironic it makes you wonder like why the filmmakers even had them drive the camper up there and how much of a you know logistical or financial burden was it to even to acquire the camper they used in the film only to have the kids like leave the camper behind it kind of makes you wonder like why not just have them go up in a van like a normal kind of van or something like that like why the camper and was the camper just something they had access to so they're like well we might as well use this but honestly you know i don't know i, I guess i understand the, the roughing it in the tents thing but like if i were them and i were driving up in a camper that big i'd probably just as soon stay in the camper honestly uh just a little brief scene of them kind of coming upon the beautiful waterfall lake area and now they're arriving at the camp site proper and this mr no sleeves will be putting on a vest because he doesn't believe in sleeves he's in a like a cut off t here he's getting out his vest because we can't have sleeves <clears throat> here's the uh the blonde kind of quietly scolding the boyfriend like you should why didn't why didn't you tell the that forest ranger where we're gonna you know be well, why did you tell him that bogus location and she's kind of like should we tell him and he's like well it's too late getting too late to do it now should we tell him where we are and she's kind of got this feeling of like oh god what's going on there's jack lemon's son with the whistle around his neck Does a bear shit in the woods? <clears throat> the 
So, not the biggest fan of the uh, <clears throat> redhead in this film, but that's okay. I definitely prefer the blonde chick in this movie as we dissolve into a fire, campfire, tent set up. This is probably like if, if I was going to, you know, waste my money and, and, and get the rights to play that Blondie song, I probably would have played it here versus, you know, the introduction of the characters. I mean, it's just a waste of money anyway you 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 slice it. It's kind of ironic that they paid for the, the, you know, the rights to use it in that one scene. So now I can't remember. I think something's on some just generic. I would imagine Brad Fidel music is is playing in the boombox here i think because <clears throat> some muzak or, or whatever it's called so that's it's kind of just ironic like usually if a movie's got the enough budget to 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 get the rights for a popular song like they've got a big enough budget to get more than one song and this movie got the rights to one song and it's used up and now they have to have a scene where they just got you know, just nonsense playing on the uh, the boombox. And later on when they're dancing, there's this goofy-ass, I would imagine, Brad Fidel tune that's like, eh, I can't shit, I can't remember it. It's like, baby, eh, baby, eh, baby. That's coming up later, though, but... At this point, the blonde is, is hearing something out in the woods, and they're all getting freaked out. Pretty cool and effective and, and moody, but I just eat this stuff up like this. Campsite, campfire, she's thinking it's her boyfriend. It's a pretty realistic fire. It's probably a... Oh, look at Mr. Franklin's like, here, you want this knife? <laughs> like why don't you use it buddy redhead grabs it okay who the hell's out there i don't think i don't know if that i'm just i'm just uh what's that term guessing what she's saying as uh i'm ashamed to say i'm not very familiar with this movie and enough to really do the dialogue or very much of it but as we can see or maybe not see if no if you're not watching this just listening boyfriends come out of the bush and scare them the, the three scared out of their wits campers and what's his name's got a bottle of wine blonde is st still thinks something's out there and i think that hand that was on the tree was in fact like that blonde uh whatever you want to call it mountain girl that comes shows up later i you know i i do think that that girl is out there watching them blonde is pissed because uh mr sleeves don't exist and the other guy played that joke scaring him. Yeah, honestly, when I'm watching this and, and the, Jack, the, 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 the Jack Lemmon's son character, it's kind of annoying. And that's kind of one of the reasons I'm not the biggest fan of this movie. Like, he's kind of annoying. And the, the redhead, I think, is kind of annoying. I like the character of, like, Mr. Sleeveless and his girlfriend and stuff. Like, um... As we see her the next morning wrapped up in a blanket. I like them too. But the Jack Lemon son and the redhead I'm not keen on. And I guess I don't really care one way or another about Mr. Four Eyes and photographer guy. This is the part of the movie where this blonde is kind of disappointed in herself for not taking initiative and the, and the night before and grabbing the knife like the redhead did. She just felt like a helpless little child. This is where she's going to make the 180 degree change from the beginning or from the character she is now towards the end, which is actually one of the, in my opinion, one of the coolest things about the movie. 
And looking at this blonde here wrapped up in a blanket, yeah, she's she's definitely definitely a cutie pie, and I, I love her character in the movie. And honestly, a, as she does, I, I'm not keen on her transition, like her her uh, physical or appearance or her appearance transition. I don't towards the end of the movie, which I mean, I mean anyone who's listening to this knows, I would imagine knows this movie, so I can just say it that the transition goes from this kind of plain Jane, maybe virginal kind of, almost maybe tomboyish kind of character to more of, uh, you know, her hair comes and she lets her hair down throughout the course of the movie, ends up with short shorts and putting like lipstick on and stuff and, you know, the short shorts are fine and the hair down's fine, but I'm not the biggest makeup on women kind of a guy and honestly I think uh, the way she appears in this movie at this point you know, <clears throat> is the way I prefer kind of just hair up, no makeup, or at least no discernible makeup. So now all five of these characters are coming ac across this kind of mountain girl, if you will, kind of, I don't know what, drinking or and or washing up on in the stream there, scaring her away. That, uh, the shirt that the redhead is wearing, I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing, but it's kind of horribly 80s. The shirt could be from the 70s, I guess. There's Mr. Sleeveless. They leave uh, Jack Lemon's son, leaves behind a cigarette wrapper and scary killer boots stomp on it we see a beautiful image of i don't know if it's a river eh, probably a river i would imagine beautiful image of water possibly a river i don't know if it's going into or coming from yeah it looks like a river that kind of lake i, I do want to say though like okay there's like falls there that that kind of lake and waterfall area that i think yeah it shows up again in the movie because it's kind of a pivotal scene with the the toplessness of the the redhead. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Plays a more of a that the the waterfall in the lake comes back in that topless redhead pivotal scene. But now we're introducing the rope bridge, which is really, really kind of scary. And just I don't know if you're watching along with me. It's just so rickety. It's just like oh my god. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure I would be. Uh, up for doing this and yeah I probably wouldn't because it's just so rickety and it looks like those there's like a rope on each side to hold on to it's like you're kind of walking on a big thick rope and then there's a rope on each side to hang on to but the, the rope that you hang on to are so just like I don't know rickety and stuff it's just kind of scary beautiful shot of some waterfalls there but that rope bridge is just being introduced now and it'll go on to be a little more of a integral play a more integral part later on just like the <laughs> i'm just laughing see now okay there's a there's a shot of the three people from the side which are all probably stunt doubles the one guy nearly falls off oh my god did a little bit of a stunt there I could just remember like the Ooh, just whatever vocalization was going on there. Okay, they're making their way up onto the other side. Beautiful trees and sky in the background. If you happen to be watching with me. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the redhead's yellow shirt in this scene with their like purple and blue shoulder patches, but whatever. Yeah, I probably wouldn't traverse that bridge. Okay, now there's the waterfall god. I wonder how many feet, that's, that's a really... Oh, I wonder if this is supposed to be a dip. This is probably supposed to be a different waterfall in a lake than that one that was seen earlier. I think it's a completely different one. <clears throat> because they must be, this might be the first time they're coming across it. Jack Lemon's son's just gonna play it not too 
safely and he ends up rolling down the hill he's like last one down is a rotten and then he falls down the hill and I think here he says egg or something like that or, or rotten egg or something and now the redhead's gonna just kind of much to the behest of uh, or whatever the terminology is sleeveless guy sleeveless guy is like the I think out of all these young people I think he's like the uh, most most uh, accomplished mountain climber everyone's just kind of as he does it the correct way walking down a hill left to right left to right everyone else is kind of throwing themselves down okay so see this, this that shows how much I or how much how little I actually am familiar with this film there's two okay there's a guy in whitey tidies there's two separate like waterfalls and whatever lakes okay so redhead just becomes topless and Jack Lemon's son puts the bikini top thing swimsuit top thing on his head and his whitey tidies and socks I think he even got socks on I think yep oh my god and by the way if, if you're ever doing that like and you're walking over wet wet rocks I uh you know be careful because those things get slippery they definitely get slippery right now see now the the blonde who I would regard as the cuter of the two main actresses in the film is kind of I think she's her character here although I don't think she has anything to be jealous of she I think her character is kind of jealous of the you know just uh, uninhibited nature of the redhead and as you can see her boyfriend is kind of <laughs> watching the topless redhead but yeah she uh, you know the, the blonde's got nothing to worry about I I uh, I like her more than the topless redhead so she's got nothing to worry about now we're seeing okay well we, we briefly saw the kind of the mountain mountain girl there watching them have fun um, I, I listened to the commentary or, or watched behind the scenes interviews or whatever and I guess when they were filming this scene with the topless chick like there were all kinds of people up on some overlook watching them film the scene so it's just like that yeah, figures this scene I think is pretty cool where you know the uh, whatchamacallit Jack Lemon's son kind of plays a trick oh okay so first he pretends to be drowned here and plays a trick on her but what ends up happening later on is, is really pretty cool where he's on the oh I saw I saw her stick her tongue out there I mean they're kissing and she stuck her tongue she offered his, her tongue to, to him but this shot right here if you're watching with me and even if you're not is a shot of them kissing in the background you can see like the killer kind of coming out of the falls and, and going you know he's got the vest on and the the orange vest and the orange cap going out of the falls into the you know the water and this is the scene I was talking about which is pretty cool where this uh, whatever the hell his name is Jack Lemon char son character <clears throat> is gonna swim to shore and the killer is basically gonna feel up the redhead and she thinks it's boyfriend and she finds out it's not kind of a cool little thing but um you know, as, as we're probably like, it looks like uh, on the little counter there, 37 minutes into the film, there comes the killer's hand on her bare back. At this point, we pretty much know, even though we haven't seen what's his name on the shore yet, kind of pretty much know that, yeah, this is probably, uh, yeah, his hand, his, his arm's all dirty. This is probably not her boyfriend. Yeah, there's Whitey Teddy on the sh rocky shore. So she's playing with this guy in the water there she just realizes oh my god who was I playing with they managed to make a fire on the rocks which I don't know how they managed that yeah it's like <laughs> Over there! 
Uh, yeah, I really don't know much of the dialogue of this, do I? If I did, I would have. I'd be doing much more of it. She said something there before the dissolve to the woods that uh, there was a hand touching me, and I thought it was you, and I saw you on the shore, which meant it wasn't you. And <laughs> she had trying to get all this dialogue in in a short period of time, cutting back to uh, George. I think it's George Kennedy talking to his plants again. Jesus Christ. Egg at the, the plant. And like I say, I don't know what in the movie. I, the horse now is probably getting riled up because the sleepaway camp, you know, drunken character is probably crawling around out there. But the first scene with, you know, George Kennedy and the horse, I don't know why the horse was getting all agitated. But here we find, or he finds, this boozer character with his head in the, uh, I guess, horse trough or whatever. And now, um, sleepaway camp guy is sleepaway camp owner guy is telling George Kennedy this big monstrous mountain man that he saw and killed Vachel. Isn't that the goofiest name? For, I mean, I was going to say for a guy, but it's really a goofy name for anyone. Vachel, like V-A-C-H, I don't know how you'd spell it, A-E-L, Vachel. I saw the horse back there kind of jump like there was a loud noise or something. <clears throat> but honestly, you know, you know, being like, at this point, like 40 minutes into the film, this is kind of why, as I'm watching it right now, I've never really connected a hundred percent with this film because like, I don't know, it's like 40 minutes into the movie and let's face it, not a whole hell of a lot has happened. And I guess that's one of my reasons why this movie never was, did a whole hell of a lot for me. Don't get me wrong, I like it, but I'm more, you know, I'm not a huge fan of it. I, my, you know, my, my liking of this movie is just kind of, I can't think of the, the term, but uh, whatever. Casual fan of, of Just Before Dawn. And, and now we are into the, the kind of laughable scene with the uh, redhead dancing with all these other, everyone but her boyfriend. And blonde chick is probably getting kind of jealous. And this is the scene with the horribly funny, like, you know, hey, baby. Eh, baby. What I used to do <clears throat> is, uh, well, I still do, but okay, Blonde's getting in on the dancing as well there, yay. Um, you know, I'd rip uh, DVD movie audio and put it into MP3 and then, like, with one of those, like, iPod docs, you know, back when, when I was, you know, working, <laughs> I'd... I'd, uh, I'd, and I had to get up for work, I, I'd, you know, I'd wake up to movies, you know, I'd, I'd wake up to The Fun House, the original Slumber Party Massacre, and I'd even wake up, oh, okay, so Blonde's hair is finally coming down, although I kind of think she looked almost better with it up, but she, oh, Blonde's hips are wiggling, and I think the, the boyfriend is seeing a side of the blonde here that he, he did, has never seen before, hair is definitely, he's drinking and liking what he's seeing, but yeah, so I, I, you know, I'd, I'd wake up to, uh, to movies, you know, the fun how <laughs> I'm looking at this guy is like dumbfounded, like, wow, I take my, uh, turn up the volume there, take my girlfriend out in the woods and suddenly virginal, in, you know, inhibited girlfriend's becoming a, uh, turn it up even more, is becoming a, uh, an, a wild woman, you know, and a good, <laughs> the, uh, the the whatchamacallit just got shot the boom box but what i was saying is you know i i in back in my working days and on the you know being on the grind days if i had to work in the morning or early i'd wake up to summer party massacre the fun house and in this film so um or if it's funny how i've probably heard this movie a lot more than i've than i've seen it you think i'd know the dialogue better but uh, it, it'd just be funny laying there trying not to fall asleep, you know, fall back asleep and have to kind of try to 
you know, not fall back asleep while you're... Because I'm one of these people who can't just, like... You know, in movies, you see someone and those alarm clock goes, nee, 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 and they hit it and just, like, get up. I mean, I need, like, an at least an hour of, like, on and off. Like, I can't just get up. Like, it's just... it's I, I just need, like, at least an hour of, like, okay, kind of in and out of, of consciousness, wake up at... If I gotta be up by seven, you know, set the set the movie audio for six a.m. and kind of a thing. So what's funny about what's funny about um, what you call it, slumber party massacre is so short. I could almost listen, you know, an hour into the movie. It's almost the end of the movie. But what's really cool about that is you, if you know a movie really well, you could you could tell based on where it was in the movie what time it was, you know, approximate, you know, so. So that so waking up to I would recommend it you know <clears throat> for people if uh, if they can figure out a way to do it you know rip rip DVDs or Blu-rays or whatever and the MP3s and put it on freaking you know digit you know MP3 or put it on iPad iPod or whatever and, or whatever some kind of media player and wake up to movie soundtracks is much more agreeable than some kind of nin 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 but anyway, I was talking over the whole scene where the uh, mountain people kind of, you know, shot the uh, shot shot the boombox and came out of the woods with the uh, the rifle. And I, I, from what I heard in the commentary years ago, or the the behind the scenes, is that guy was actually like not an actor. He was so the the, the mountain man kind of guy with the rifle and the, the blonde daughter or whatever was not a he always said ah shit what's his main line ah shit see this is what i mean i should be i should know this movie better but okay so now blonde after the night of whatchamacallit she's she's making the transformation here hair down comes out of the tent with like the the short shorts the redhead shorts and the tied off shirt getting a kind of sexy i don't have a problem with this look but because there's no makeup on the face yet or no discernible makeup but <clears throat> when the makeup starts going on it's just like Ugh. shit i don't know what the hell i was talking about but oh, i was talking about the mountain man who's like not an actor he's like who uh they got for this movie i guess just because he fit his look fit the bill and oh i was trying to remember that goofy line he says a couple times in the movie like Ah, shit, I can't remember that line. He says... He says some goofy line like, uh... Ugh, I can't remember it. Something like... To, you know, to get out of here. Get out of these woods or something. I can't remember the line. It's kind of frustrating as... Jack Lemon's son is... Washing his face there in the stream. We've got the mountain girl, blonde mountain girl... Oh, I see. So she's, I, I remember now, she stole the, uh, the redhead's makeup and it's all smeared all over her face trying to be sexy for this, uh, Jack Lemon's son here. Sk skadoot? Is that what that mountain man said? I think. Skadoot. I think, which, which means, which is his way of saying get out of here. Skadoot, I think. Um, I think that's what he says. So as we can see here, Mountain Mountain Girl has a thing for Jack Lemon's son. It's really a shame, you know, about oof. She she pulls him to her lips. You know, looking at this makeup, you know, incorrectly smeared all over her face, it, it is a shame what quote unquote culture did to programming women and Making them think that they gotta smear all that crap all over their face. <clears throat> Just another one of the many levels of societal programming, but yeah, I mean, like if you look at, for example, that that blonde who you know I I find much more agreeable than the the redhead, the, the blonde girl, and the main character, kind of final girl in this movie, like. As I said, I mean, I, I don't know if she's got movie makeup or not, but if she does, it's a, in a way to make it look like she doesn't have makeup on. She just, you know, women just look so much better, just, you know, au, au naturel like that. And 
in my opinion. So now, <clears throat> this mountain girl is kind of, how is she getting, I can't remember how she's getting him to chase her, but now she leads him to this rope bridge and kind of runs into the, back into the, behind the rock. And he's like, oh, don't be afraid of this bridge, not knowing that she probably saw her brother or whatever, mountain man brother. So this is what I mean, like, oh my God. So there was a, a pretty cool kill at the beginning of the movie, and then it takes nearly 50 minutes for, and this guy doesn't even die on camera. So, you know, it, not to say that, you know, a slasher movie needs to have just a huge body count, but it is one of the things that, you know, it's a it's a small amount of characters and they don't start dying off until you know nearly 50 minutes into the movie and even when they do it's like i don't think you, you see it necessarily happen he just kind of falls in the water but here he kind of that's the first real close-up of the how, how you doing he makes it to the other side and first this is kind of cool the guy chops his hand with the machete jesus Probably double there on the far shot, running away. Now he's chopping the, oof, chopped one of the ra rope railings off. And there goes the other one. Oh, this stunt is pretty hardcore, man. Falls, oof, stuntman falls into the water, holding on to the rope. <clears throat> okay, yeah, now he's got toot, toot. <laughs> the whistle, there's that guy, he's just doing that. That laugh, that guy, hey, 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 laugh. Oh, the redhead found her caramel, I think she found her caramel cream makeup. Okay, so now the, the blonde's got her short short, not hers, the redhead short shorts on. and Tied off shirt, and now she's starting to put some nail polish on her, her fingernails and toenails, and she thinks she hears um, the whistle. I wonder if this, this blonde actress, as I'm looking at this blonde actress, I wonder if she's ever been in anything else. She's, I like her as an, you know, kind of, I just, I like her. <laughs> as an actress, you know, and yeah, this is, this, you know, when, when the nail polish starts being applied is when I'm kind of like, eh, I, you know, I'm fine with the short shorts and the tied off, you know, whatever it is, shirt, but once, 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 you know, like nail polish starts going on, it's like, oh, okay. But as we can see here, like halfway through the movie, she's making her uh, transition from virginal whatever, quote unquote, plain girl, which I don't, re you know, I don't think she's pl plain in the first half of this movie at all. It's the version of her I prefer, you know, from a v visual standpoint. <clears throat> so this uh, Jack Lemon's. Uh, Sun sees the mountain man on the other side and run away. This is where we're going to, as the viewer, about 51, 52 ish minutes into the film, are for the first time going to be shown the fact that there's not just one killer, but there's in fact two basically twin killers. And I would imagine, I'm pretty sure the same guy obviously just <clears throat> played both of them. Uh, this actor kind of doing a little bit of his own you know whatever stunts or whatever physical work crawling himself up the rope at least in some shots okay he makes his way up and we see the boot step down it's just like uh oh at this point look at now this stunt right here is that's a stunt the stuntman kind of rolls off the rock and, and falls into the water and the, the camera operator did a great job following him, follow, following the body falling into the water. That's a great stunt. And it does kind of make the viewer wonder, like, you know, what does he know another way around? Or Because we don't know, I, I guess, you know, watching this here silently as I'm doing a commentary, I guess we don't know necessarily. It's not necessarily a reveal that there's two of them. It's just like he can maybe he can either teleport or he knows another way around or he jumps real far. So it's not necessarily a, a reveal so much of, of them being twins yet, I guess. But that scene of the guy 
falling in the water always gets me. It's like, wow, that's a stunt. So now Mr. Camera Guy, fifth wheel, four eyes dude, is found, come, you know, find, found the church that was featured at the beginning of the film. And I want to say some stuff happens here. I would imagine, <clears throat> obviously, that this is just a real, it's not like they built this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine, a real kind of abandoned church that they found and they filmed in, I would imagine. I don't know very much about the behind the scenes uh, info of this film, but I would imagine that's the case for this location. A little bit of filler here as uh, the fifth wheel guy is just walking into the church. He puts his spectacles down on one of the stinky pews. Oh, that's right, in the foreground there you can see Vachel's hand, dead hand, hanging on to this little bit of uh, wall decoration that he died for. <clears throat> so the Vachel corpse is, is sitting right there in a stinky pew. Oh, a jump scare with the redhead, kind of your Nicole Kidman before Nicole Kidman. Vachel, Vachel's hand. There's a shot of like the out of focus spectacles on the pew thing. This, um, <laughs> I can't remember if they're smelling something right there or what, but this, this redhead is kind of promiscuous, really. Like, what happens here? She starts making out with, I, I want to say this, this, the spectacles guy is the brother of the. Jack Lemmon's son in this movie. They, they look nothing alike, but I think it's supposed to be his brother. Okay, here's a funny scene, which is probably, I would imagine this is a dead fish. And he's just trying to make, make it look like it's wiggling or whatever. He's scaring his girlfriend with this fish in the water. This will be the, I don't know if it happens now, but maybe later at some point, the Jack Lemmon son character will... That that one that was thrown in the water obviously is alive because it swims away. But or does it happen here? Jack Lemon's son's body will just yeah, it happens either now or later. <laughs> Come out into the water and mm, there it is. Yeah, splish. Probably a stuntman, I would imagine. And just when things are looking up for Mr. I guess he does have sleeves on in this scene. Mr. Red Shirt with sleeves. The the corpse of Jack Lemon son. It's too bad I don't know the character's names. I could say the character's names, but that's just proof on how much I really don't watch this movie. But I will say that the Blu-ray is, is, is positively striking. And I think this is some honest-to-goodness real... Look at that. Oh, my God. That's some honest-to-goodness male-on-male, mouth-to-mouth. Yeah, see? Yeah, she, careful with them rocks. She's slipping on probably w wet rocks in the water there, as I don't um, disapprove once again of her short shorts and tied-off shirt so much as the... Whatchamacallit? nail polish and the, the coming makeup she looks like a freaking night walker towards the end of the movie <laughs> street walker night walker i don't know you know what i mean but uh some actual honest to goodness mouth to mouth there a lot of times it, you know they'll they'll fake it for a movie you don't know that i think this is their way he says it that was the whistle he was calling for help he's calling for help you don't know that <laughs> Okay, so this is like almost an hour into the movie, so this is probably like when I woke up with this playing an audio back in my, you know, having to get up for work days. Probably where I had to get up pretty soon here. I had to get out of bed, her ass cheeks sticking out of the shorts. Yeah, a couple of times this character, I think it was just then, you know, he's like, you don't know that. Just the way he says it was so funny. Okay, they must be, okay, so now they're doing some photo with the redhead here in the cemetery some 
photo shoot with the four eyes dude and it looks like there's probably a definitely a there's like a fog filter or something they must have put you know on to de deliberately to make this scene look foggy kind of like what they did in uh, some of the scenes in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo as well like deliberately you know put some fog lens or filter on to give it that appearance I personally don't really like that appearance it, it makes it look like it's humid outside and there's just the lens is fogged up okay so at this point he doesn't know where his glasses are and he thinks that they both think that her boyfriend is you know creeping around the building when it's the killer and she's like oh let's give him something to think about so now they're she's smooching him to make him jealous and it's kind of a cool a cool gimmick where this guy doesn't have his glasses so he oh okay and he took his jacket so this i like this how this plays you know he can't see that it's he just sees his brother's jacket all blur on um, all blurry on the killer and he looks pissed <laughs> i see okay so he's coming into focus stab now when this guy bam when this guy falls falls down the camera which is really not something you want it's really heavy you don't really want this camera just made of steel and metal to hit you in the face when this actor falls down if you're if you're watching the movie and if you have ever slow mowed that scene when he falls down the camera smack it's around his neck the camera comes smacking and hits him in the face so is you can tell he's like oh but he's supposed to be in pain anyway because he's got a machete in his stomach but He's, that's probably real pain on his face, like, because the camera just made out of steel just smacked him in the face when he fell over, but it's funny how the machete right there is going up and down because he's breathing. And now Redhead is just discovering Vachel's hand, the body of Vachel, isn't that a funny name? Pulls out the machete, going to use it on Redhead. So that was actually the first... Um, God, it's like an hour into it, and it was the first on-screen kill since the first kill in the beginning with the same machete weapon. So, that might be one of the reasons that I never was crazy in love with this movie, is, is it's just like, I mean, it's obviously the, you know, one of the strong things it's got going for it is the fact that it's just beautiful. It's like all takes place out in the woods. So, obviously, that's a huge, you know, plus okay here is where it's behind her this is where it's definitively revealed that there's two of these guys twin you know mountain men killers because she was just looking at the other one okay yeah <clears throat> this is where it's revealed and i don't know if we if, if we're assuming i would imagine so the the redhead's death is I don't think it's on camera either, is it? I would imagine they're kind of the the one twin is probably take doing something sexual with her. I would imagine as the other as the other one takes pictures. I don't know how they're going to get them developed, but Mister No Sleeves, who I guess does believe in sleeves and blonde back at the campsite. Stakes are high. One of, one of them is dead, and you can't find the other two. Where are they? Yeah, it's crazy watching this. How little of the dialogue I actually do know. So, definitely haven't seen this for, com, very much at all compared to. Okay, there's a cat. I can rem, I can remember this cat. I think it's got like a generic movie cat, you know, unrealistic movie cat meow sound effect i think this is the i think this is the abode of the mountain people as there was a cat there there's a jackass tied up to a tree and some traps hanging there so most likely the abode of the mountain people yeah you know being an hour into this movie hour and two minutes into the movie i mean freaking three kills and only two of them were on camera yeah it's i guess that's probably one of the reasons why I was never crazy about this movie, but I guess I can stop saying the same thing over and over in regards to that.
yeah, it's funny watching this movie now, and it's just like, wow, I, I, I can't, I, I remember now that, uh, okay, Mountain Man, Skidoo, Skidoo, he's definitely got a Mountain Man look, I'll tell you that. There isn't a lot of, uh, what the hell is his name, is it Robert Kennedy, I, or George Kennedy, or John F. Kennedy, I can't remember, no, no, I think it's George Kennedy. Not very much George Kennedy stuff in this movie, is there? Jesus Christ. The the, the woman who's playing this guy's quote unquote wife or whatever is like twenty or thirty years younger than he is, but it's probably <clears throat> realistic mountain men relationships. Skidoo. Man, that guy's red shirt sure is red on this Blu-ray release. Yeah, the, the, her ass cheeks sticking out of the shorts. Okay, now it's nighttime at the campsite. He's got a fire going. And So what's interesting about this movie, and one of the things that I do think kind of sets it apart from other movies like it from the era, is that it's interesting how it does a kind of a, a, a role reversal or a, a role swap, if you will, where the, uh, the male character kind of gets, you know, terrified and, and petrified and becomes helpless. And the female character who started the movie is kind of helpless and petrified turns into more of a an able-bodied character <clears throat> this scene they kind of look equally helpless right now as this guy is scared and she's kind of catatonic she does that look she does that really well the tents in this movie are very similar to uh tents that or the tent that rob's got in final chapter Oh, it's later on is a funny scene where the, one of the tents falls over, and I don't even know why it falls over. If it's supposed to be like one of the killers is there and he chopped it down or whatever, but the guy's like, "Did you set up that tent? Who told you how to set up a tent, huh?" It's just funny. <clears throat> it's funny what happens to the male this this guy, you know, the, the final girl's boyfriend, as the movie wears on. There's one of your classic twin mantle Coleman lanterns. Essential for any camping trip. I'm a sucker for, for those things. I, I love those things. It just kind of goes with the whole genre, camping genre. And I love that, that, that they're so prominently featured in the first Friday the 13th. And, it's like you gotta have your Coleman lantern in your camping outdoor horror film slasher at least once. Guy's telling catatonic girlfriend he's gonna. I can't remember what. <clears throat> I think is he going to like get the the key the keys to the camper out of the pockets of the guy I can't remember why he's going back I think he's going back to the corpse of the guy who they found in the river I can't remember why though it must be to get the keys but why would he have the keys because I think the camper belongs to the Mr. Blonde guy but anyway there's coming up if you're watching with me or even if you're not there's a shot coming up that's from the trailer a classic shot of him kind of Oh, we saw moth, moths flying around the lantern there. Him, like, you know, moving the lantern from side to side and kind of illuminating the dead body that's leaning up against the tree. Yeah, there you go. It's just a shot of him. It's really cool with the, the water in the background kind of lit by the with a light, like a blue gel there. That's really visually pleasing. 
Mr. Vest. Okay, yeah. Moves the lantern over, sees corpse with sunglasses <laughs> leaning against the tree. <laughs> does he do it again? I think he does it again. Yeah, because this time he'll see it himself. And I think, yeah, oh, there it is. Oh, God, and he does it twice before he sees it. That's funny. So I think, you know, one of the mountain people, maybe the killer, actually leaned him up against the tree. Okay, he's going to find him now. Oh! And at first he thinks he's joking. You son of a bitch! And then, oh, sh oh, shit. You're dead still. That was kind of interesting. But one of the killers must have leaned him up against the tree and put the glasses on him. Is that the, oh, I think those are the glasses from the the uh, photographer guy, the, the fifth wheel guy. They're like, prob maybe they're prescription sunglasses or something. I think it was so funny how, you know, when he f just discovers the body right now that he thought he was joking. Like, he was clearly dead in early, earlier in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, he must be digging in his pockets for the keys. I don't know why this guy would have the keys to his camper. But, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, once again... Oh, I think I said I was going to stop saying this, but... Nearly uh, an hour and ten minutes in, and not a whole lot actually happens in this movie, but that's okay. <clears throat> it's funny how, you know, I, I was kind of... As I'm watching it, I'm kind of comparing it to don't go in the woods a little bit and kind of wondering well which one would i rather watch and obviously there's a i mean there's a plethora of kills and, and don't go in the woods compared to this but you know i mean obviously this is going to be a more you know all around more competent film than don't go in the woods but i think don't go in the woods honestly at least in the first two thirds of it honest, honestly has a lot more interesting stuff going on like just so many just introduced you know, victims and kill them over and over and over kind of thing. And the absurdity of Don't Go in the Woods is, is probably much more entertaining at the end of the day than this film, although this film you would regard as being more competent as Don't Go in the Woods. There's things about Don't Go in the Woods that, you know, rival this film, probably overall entertainment value. My, You know, I, uh, I think it was last year I did a commentary on Don't Go in the Woods, and... I love that movie, but the problem with that movie is like the last third of it is just so boring, and it's just like God. It's just there's, there's a couple movies like that where for for whatever reason, like the the part of the movie that should be some of the most interesting, you know, like the last third is actually just boring as shit, and that's one of the the bummers about Don't Go in the Woods, in my opinion. And I mean, this movie here, watching it on silent, I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's it's like I'm you know you like I can't say that nothing ever happens in the movie, but it is interesting how like not a whole lot really happens in this movie. George Kennedy just rode up on his horse to the mountain men, you know, abode or whatever, and basically I think he's basically telling them I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna kill the mountain man or whatever, and Blondie. Barefoot, she must not own shoes. That's actually really runs out in the woods. That's really good casting. Like that blonde, really does seem like a mountain woman. Now she's gonna hitch a ride with. Uh, is it George Kennedy? I can't remember. <clears throat> and and tell them where the camper kids are. Cutting back to blonde wrapped in the blanket, just kind of catatonic. Yeah, see. I guess the reason she takes charge is because she's forced to because of a, you know, her her boyfriend becomes inept. Yeah, she you can see. I don't know if you're watching with me, but if you are, she she had this natural urge to like because her cheeks are sticking out of the shorts right there. She stood up, her hand almost went back to like try to pull down the shorts, but then she's like, "Whoop, I'm in a movie. Can't." Even if she tried pulling it down, they wouldn't go down probably anyway. But yeah, you know, <laughs> I keep saying that I'm not gonna say it anymore. But you know, watching this movie, 
it, it doesn't have a whole, not a whole lot happens in it, but it's, it's fun to, uh, just to look at because as I said, the whole thing takes place in the beautiful great outdoors. This scene here where I guess she's hearing noises from the woods is kind of like a, a callback to the earlier scene. And uh, is she going to grab the knife this time? I can't remember. She's got the hair down. She's probably much more able. God, she's barefoot. Just like the mountain woman. But it, she seems, you know, strangely not kind of almost like at home in the woods right here. Almost as if the more time she spends out here, the more it just becomes, oh, okay. Here comes the killer upon her. Just kind of kneels down and, oh, he blows the whistle, I see. Oh, this is the scene that, uh, okay, now th that was actually nighttime and now we're basically day for night here. It's kind of a bummer when you've got a movie that's got, like, <clears throat> night scenes. Like, I think all of the night scenes in this movie up until this point were actually night for night. And then, oh, okay, now we're back to night for night. Yeah, that's kind of a bummer when you have, when you alternate in, in the same scene between, like, night for night and day for night. Like, if you're going to, kind of like the burning, if you're going to have a day for night, just just do all day for night but when you're alternating between night for night and day for night in, in the same scene it really it really uh sticks out more in my opinion i'm pretty sure yeah almost except for maybe the campfire stuff in the burning like a lot of the burning nighttime stuff is is day for night because she climbs up the tree and the guy's hacking at the, the base of the tree with the machete. Also, some of the trailer footage. It's, she she's she becomes, you know, she's become very kind of primal, you know, like a freaking animal at this point, like a scared cat or something. Climbs the tree to hanging onto the tree for dear life. Um, George Kennedy here. Yeah, he doesn't have much screen time at all. I'd forgotten how little he's got, but one thing I will say, once again, watching the 88 Films Blu-ray on silent here, it's a very handsome looking Blu-ray. And we've got Mr. Inept guy with the vest coming out of the bush here, almost got blown away by George Kennedy here. Um, yeah, something that I'm thinking of right now is, is the producer, the, the producer, I think it's the producer of Texas Chainsaw 3D. Um, he did a commentary and interviews and stuff on the Blu-ray of Texas Chainsaw 3D and his voice is like verbatim. Like he sounds, he sounds like if you ever needed to, to loop a George Kennedy line or, or, you know, make any alternate dialogue get that guy because he sounds just like George Kennedy. I want to say he even looked like him, but I know he sounded just like him. I think it's like the producer or one of the producers on Texas Chainsaw 3D. He sounded like George Kennedy voice, but I'm just thinking of that when I saw George Kennedy. This scene is really kind of fun. You know, chicks up there like a scared animal clinging to the tree and this guy's blowing the whistle, chopping the base of the tree and it's gonna come crashing down here we've got oh man quite the stunt there done for real I would imagine the stunt woman did that tree stunt back to you know day for night having come from a night for night shot back to night for night see you know, don't go, don't alternate, you know, don't go from night to night, day for night, back to night for night. It's just like whatever. But this whole time he's blowing the whistle, he's going to raise the machete. Bam. Bam. I think he gets shot, falls over onto her kind of. Say George Kennedy, is it George? George Kennedy saves the day, smoking rifle. Looks like they just made love. Like she's laying there, he's laying there next to her with his arm around her. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, when you first see it, you don't know if uh, if she's dead, you know, from the sheer impact of this guy or not. 
but moments here we'll find out that she's not. Kind of crying there with the... I wonder if... I wonder if they got a bigger size jacket for this killer to wear. I don't know if that would have fit. I, I wasn't paying attention to how well that jacket was fitting them. Got Mr. Inept Vest guy trying to dig his girlfriend out from under the killer. At this point, I would imagine both of these characters think that one and done killer, uh, everyone here, George Kennedy character and the, the couple here, the, the surviving couple probably think that, oh, day for night, god damn it. <laughs> god, I wonder why. It's got to alternate between night for night and day for night. At this point, all three of them probably think the trouble's over. Day, back to night for night. Jesus. Rolls them over. Uh... It's a shame, too, because the night for night stuff is, is lit really well. Like some of these shots. Back to day for night. Oh, my God. Yeah, not a fan of that, but I'm not going to give the movie too much shit, but... I mean, when you go... When you've got a scene that just keeps alternating back and forth from... Night for night to day for night, it's like, okay. What's the reasoning? <clears throat> it, might, it might just be time, you know, maybe the sun came up and you got to get this stuff in the can. It's like, well... Whatever. Okay, an hour and... 20 minutes into the film and basically at this point it seems like uh, the threat has been whatever eliminated at this point night back to night for night oh my god oh this is where he's saying they're not dead then he's got this smile like he, he's in denial that is that the other two or the other three people are dead they're not dead we're not dead. He's got this smile. So this is the part of the movie I think is really weird. Like, the, 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 the forest ranger guy just leaves them behind. Leaves them to fend for themselves. But I guess I guess it makes sense if, uh, if he thinks the threats have been eliminated. But now it's night. It's still night. It must be the same night or whatever. A guy's, inept guy, vest guy's packing up. I don't... I, I would imagine the blonde is in the tent like putting her finishing touches on her, you know, applying the makeup on her face, kind of the finishing touches on her, you know, transition from virginal, quote-unquote, boring, okay, here she comes, boring girlfriend to sex kitten. Uh, yeah, see, I don't like that. Look, that's like streetwalker time, and she's just so... <laughs> hey, look at you. I love this guy here. He's funny. Yeah, Streetwalker. How much? I, I don't know what he's saying here, but he I, it just... Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's one of the dialogues. You never know who you're going to run into out in the woods. Some of them are kind of cute. Okay, that's a recurring line. That's... Okay. Okay, now they hear noise. Because that was... Cause, one of the characters earlier on is like, "Are you gonna? Why do you need makeup out here?" And the redhead's like, "We well, never know who you're gonna run into." Now they're hearing noises from the woods. The guys, you know, this woman's kind of just sick of being the pansy, and she's like taking charge. The guys hugging her for help, for comfort. And this is pretty soon is where one of the tents is just gonna collapse in on itself. And honestly, I don't even know why that happens. If, if the tent, I'm, I'm kind of thinking the tent just falls in on its own. It has nothing to do with the killer or anything. There it goes. Bloop. <laughs> Would you set up that tent? Who told you taught you how to set up a tent? I said that earlier. Did you set up that tent? Oh my god, that guy! I, I, that guy is so funny in this part of the movie is just so pansy it's so funny the woman's just so sick of being terrorized from the you know the darkness of the woods she's gonna 
take initiative. She's all dressed for it with the makeup and Daisy Dukes. She's ready for anything that's going to come out of the woods. And, and, uh, yeah. Honestly, I will say I, I do like how she she offs the killer eye, you know, I'll, I'll just save it for when it happens in a couple moments here, but we'll talk about it as it's happening. But look at all this kind of filler, I guess, but I mean, it's, uh, okay, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, point of view, uh We've got the, the twin killer here. Looks like the inept guy got, okay, she jumps on, got chopped with the machete and, oh yeah, the, the stuffing's coming out of the vest. Stunt lady falls on the ground off the back of the killer man. Bam! She's ready to defend her inept boyfriend. Bam! Punching him or whatever. Look at the guy. Well, I don't know if you've seen it. Oh, uh, now that must be this this scene where she he's the guy's holding her up. I mean, I bet those shorts are. Look at that. Like cutting into her crotch like nothing. You ever would want to have to happen have happen to you to you, but. Trying to do a bear hug on this chick. Blood's coming out of her mouth. Looks like the killer's succeeding. And that boyfriend watches on in horror. Paralyzed with fear. Well, to be fair, he's got a wound. Now she's going... She's not going to take it. She starts raving like an animal. Falls to the ground. Kind of attack... I don't know. Killer kind of... You know, okay, well, she's... Regardless, she's attacking him, kind of. It is interesting how it's a role reversal, like the boy, the boyfriend's cowering in fear. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> this is really cool now. She's got to kill this guy. This is one of the coolest, one of the most nasty things in a movie, really. And it just looks so real. Like she's just shoving, she kills this guy by shoving her fist, her whole hand in his mouth and just like suffocating him with shoving her arm in his down his throat and what's interesting the the way she's kind of on top of him it's kind of slightly sexual as well like i bet the guy had a woody when they were filming it because i bet he never had you know a woman like this on top of him before i bet you anything he had a woody during this he's like well, let's do it again i can do it better Oh, I can remember here as she's removing her hand, there's this really nasty, realistic kind of sound effect of like... I can't really do it, cause, but it's like this really nasty sound, which actually really comes across as really realistic, like the, the exhale of whatever remaining breath that the corpse had left in it. But anyway, say what you will about the movie, but that ending, man... <laughs> that shot where it was just like... Her pelvic area, like the cameraman didn't pan up with her head for some reason. I don't know if that's how it was supposed to be, but that was funny. Okay, now it's dawn. For real, fire is still going. I love how fires just can burn for endlessly in movies without any wood needing to be added. But yeah, so it looks like the makeup, I think they have a, maybe you just can't tell as well in the in the daylight but it doesn't look like them her makeup is as heavy in the in the dusk light here but yeah that is really cool how she dispatched the second killer with shoving her fist in his mouth and here comes uh, out of the bush this is i don't think i really mentioned it but the, these two killers the two the two male twin killers are you know the brothers of this this mountain girl and this, the sons of the mountain man. Yeah, the, the sh shot of the blonde here. Bloody fist, Daisy Duke's ass cheeks sticking out. She ain't taking no shit from the woods anymore. Meanwhile, boyfriend, helpless, co cowering on the ground, weeping. Uh, help me, uh, my best. Oh, look at that. Okay, now the fire is just out smoking. <clears throat> yeah, honestly, it did go from, like, night to, to morning a little quickly, but 
we'll let it we'll let it slide so yeah see the guy falls to his knees and kind of hugs her kind of you know the 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 roles here are reversed female to male male to female whatever it is kind of interesting how the the guy who got to play the killer in this movie got to play two killers and died twice you can bet your bottom dollar he only got paid you know to play he didn't get paid double i don't imagine but makes you wonder if if the if the guy who played the killer you know resented the fact that he probably got paid in the normal amount to pay to play two different characters or if he liked it or whatever but the credits are rolling George Kennedy might yeah okay you know the cast but yeah so there is um, whatever just before dawn a movie that I like but I don't love and I'm, I'm I, I was I'm just I have just been reminded why I like and don't love it I mean it's very 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 pretty like the whole damn thing takes place out in the you know woods and very very pretty to to watch and behold but not a whole hell of a lot of uh you know if body count or lack thereof is an issue for anyone out there you just be warned that you know just before dawn let, let's try to count the kills right now the first scene and then okay so there's there's five of them went out there so so i guess is it four well i guess if you count the two killers that's five and six so if you, if you count the two killers that also get killed that's i guess six kills in the in the film oh there you go filmed on location in oregon okay yeah very very great filming location for this movie definitely but yeah this is very pretty shot though that they use for the beginning and closing credits with the sunset or sunrise or whatever it is i will say that so that is my fan commentary of just before dawn it's actually probably the first movie that i've done a commentary for where i'm not you know where I'm not a huge fan of the movie kind of a thing so that was kind of interesting to like experience it to, to be to not be like out of all the commentaries I've done so far this is probably the movie that I'm least familiar with like everything else I've done you know freaking Halloween first three Halloweens and the first uh eight Friday the 13th and Terror Train and Sleepaway Camps and slayer don't go in the woods whatever else i did commentaries on i mean i know those movies a lot better than this one you know i don't watch this very often at all so it's kind of interesting to do a commentary for a movie i wasn't very familiar with and as a you know it's first time i've ever seen it with no sound is like it's kind of weird seeing it and it's just like seeing the people's mouths move and it's just like god i don't even know what the hell they're saying i feel like i should know you know normally when i do these i do know like every freaking line but not in this case but anyway thank you very much for listening to this commentary hope you enjoyed I guess that pretty much does it for this one thanks a lot for listening and as always we'll catch you on the next one